Clashes continue in Burnaby, but protesters' cries sound more like anti-capitalist, anti-government anarchy than sole concern for the environment. What we are seeing here and what's going on all around the world now is a battle between mindsets. A mindset on the one hand of people who have lived in place for thousands of years and understand what it means to have respect for the land that gives them their lives. There's a battle between that, the indigenous perspective, and the dominant societies now, the dominant worldview, that sees this not as sacred territory, but as opportunity. Hmm. It seems to me most of the people around Mr. Suzuki, who, by the way, crawled all the way to BC, he would never fly in a plane. Uh, they seem to be very white to me. And now this talk of sacred ground, um, if we applied that to, I don't know, a, a, a Christian place, I wonder how the left would react to that. The Kinder Morgan pipeline protesters, Burnaby, BC, I don't think they're going to achieve anything. Many have been arrested already for disobeying a court order, crossing police lines. What are they fighting for? The environment? Protecting the land in Burnaby? To many, including our next guest, there's more anarchy and anti-capitalism in these displays than anything else, which is exactly the reason their demonstrations won't get them anywhere. Joining us now from Vancouver is Brent Stafford, who wrote a piece uh, over the, uh, the, the weekend, or was it the end of the week, he'll tell us, that I, I know has caused a lot of reaction. I thought it was terrific. Welcome to you, sir. Thanks, Michael. When did the piece appear? Uh, well, basically, it's our dual column that we do in 24 Hours Vancouver here, which comes out every Monday, but uh, released online on Sunday. And we argued uh, this week about whether or not if the protesters uh, up there in Burnaby uh, that are protesting Kinder Morgan are going to make a difference, and I've argued most certainly not. Why not? Well, fundamentally, their demands are unreasonable. They're not feasible. They're looking for Canadians to stop building new energy infrastructure, to stop maintaining existing infrastructure, and then, of course, we must shut down the tar sands. And as we know, there's no real tar there, so the term's pejorative. They, they basically are hell-bent on upending our entire economic system, and they're using fossil fuels as the way to kind of do that. Mm. Now, we heard Suzuki there, who always finds some sort of demonstration to attend, and he was implying that this was about the Aboriginal people. Most of the people I have seen arrested and people who are being angry and aggressive are not Aboriginal. They're very white and very middle class. Yeah, I mean, it's like anything that you get at these kinds of protests. I'm sure it's similar across Canada, definitely, probably a lot more hyper here in British Columbia. There's always a grab bag of issues in which people are protesting about. And usually it's First Nations, of course, and then you've yeah. got the people locally that are upset about potentially maybe some environmental damage. The key thing here is that there's this prevailing thought that there is a uh, big bad American uh, oil company that's coming in to install a dangerously, a, an environmentally dangerous pipeline here in our backyard and they kind of, they don't want that. But really, in, in my sense, my argument here, though, is that if fundamentally, because they're actually going at the economic system and they're going at fossil fuels, and that's because fossil fuels are actually responsible for driving capitalism. If you look at it, carbon, of course, the Industrial Revolution was powered by coal. Then you have gasoline powered the, 21st cent or the 20th century. And then hopefully here in the 21st, it's going to be natural gas. So if you want to attack capital accumulation, growth, and everything that they find wrong with free market democratic capitalism, you go after fossil fuels. And you do it like a dog on a bone. Mm. Well, uh, David Suzuki has something else to say. He has quite a lot to say. And uh, he did have a, a very long, apparently emotional anecdote about his father making a really bad cabinet, but how he <laughs> valued this cabinet and kept it in his house. Of course, Suzuki being the first person ever to keep something made by a parent that meant something emotionally, and the, the hubris uh, of these people. But then what he said, I thought, was quite... Well, it illustrated what is going on and what you wrote about. Let's see that clip now, please. I realise those are the things that make my property my home, and they are priceless. <laughs> but on the market, they are worthless. And that's our problem. If we continue to look at the land and the world around us, just in terms of dollars and cents, we are going to destroy the very things that make that land so precious to us, the very things that keep us alive and healthy. That's what this battle is about. What utter gibberish. Now, I, I assume even if you have more than one home, as some people might, 
I think. Uh, <laughs> it matters yeah. even more. By the way, I have to say, his father, of course, took away a unionized job by making that cabinet. It could have been made by a skilled worker who was part of a union. So how dare he? Well, true, of course. Actually, good cabinet makers generally are probably, are probably are unionized. I turned David Suzuki out a long time ago in the 90s. They really, it is a market complaint that they have, and everything is about distribution. They wanted, they miss, they miss the fact that democracy inherently is about individual freedom and property rights. And those property rights are rights for companies to be able to do things with property, rights of countries to be able to manage their natural resources and the way they talk about democracy and rights it's pretty much collective I, I mean they've done a pretty good job I think of uh, co-opting the word democracy and pulling that into their left-wing agenda mm. democracy though demands a respect for the rule of law and law and order and the decisions of a people who vote for a parliament or an assembly. Now, in this case, the police, who, who are, if, if you like, the, the vehicles, the weapons of the people, the democratic people, told the demonstrators not to do certain things, and they said to the police, you can go to hell. They didn't care. It seems to me they're very anti-democratic. Yes. Uh, well, they pick and choose what laws they want to follow, and that's why it doesn't make any sense at all. Here's the catch-22 that you have. They complain that there's total injustice and that the government is corrupt and the police are corrupt and the courts are corrupt. And then, of course, if you follow through a proper court process and go through a full regulatory hearing process and everything operates the way it should be, well... You're, you're stuck because they won't accept any of the rulings. So where is it? You know, they, they fight for justice, but yet only their justice. Mm -hmm. And it really is a problem. Now, I, I admire people who feel a cause is dear to their heart. We, we went to interview just recently some people who were protesting uh, chickens being moved from, to a slaughterhouse. And I didn't agree with them, but I could see there was a genuine decency and, and passion about them. But the, these demonstrators... They have so much time on their hands. Some of them, you said, every single demonstration. They're, they're not going to be hurt. They're, they're handled very kindly by the police. They're taken away. They're released. They become celebrities in their, their little communities. When you've seen, as I'm sure you have, genuine fear in demonstrations in other countries, people who demonstrate and they think they could, they could just disappear afterwards, I, I, I don't get angry, but I just find it rather pathetic. I think their cause is absurd. We practice a catch-and-release protester policy here in British Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, got it. Well, uh, please write more. I know the reaction uh, was both positive and very critical, but it's the critical ones that define you as a, as a decent writer. Appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. And let us know what you think about this issue in particular. It's fascinating. You can email me at the arena at sunmedia.ca. You can find me on Twitter at Michael Corrin. And there's a lot more of the arena. A lot more still to come.